who I could talk to and sort of help me and be that outlet for me. And so for me, that's God. So it's very like personal. And I think, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, it's so unfair how it's been um, politicized so much. And, and I'm like, you know, I don't, I wish like the scarf weren't visible. You know, I just wish like nobody would just give me any second thought, but it's just something like so personal and meaningful for me. Um, and I feel like, you know, I don't know, I feel like when, I, when I'm when i just like wearing it and dressed, I feel like, okay, it's reminding me um, of like the realities of life, you know, the very like fragile reality of life. And, um, and I, you know, we don't really hear that very often. I think from any people of faith, not just Muslims, but just in general, like why they're called to their faith. And um, yeah, it's so easy to talk theoretics and like, um, is there a God, is it there a God? But at the end of the day, you know, what helps you, you know, through your day is a very important question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I think that's a common struggle. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. the struggle to be faithful yeah. is something that we can we could do each in our own terms mm -hmm. and with our own uh, loyalties and commitments. Yeah. But we still can do it together in the sense that we can support each other to be faithful yeah. um, mm -hmm. um, in a world that would otherwise uh, claim our loyalties yeah. in other places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, you, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit about what you've done and do. Um, mm -hmm. You have, uh, you and Omar um, yeah. started Impact uh, Southern California. Tell us a little bit about what that is and, and what, what kind of inspired you and Omar to, to start that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my husband and I, we both met as volunteers, so we were um, both youth volunteers, and because I was on the East Coast and he was on the West, but we met um, through our volunteer work. Um, and so we both have just kind of felt this um, call, and I think it stemmed from like our religious understanding to kind of aid and help the poor and the sick. And um, so we just started, um, we, we joined a lot of the churches in the area and doing um, feedings, home, weekly homeless feedings. Um, but then we, you know, we did it for maybe two years and then we realized that this, we're just feeding the same people over and over again. Um, so we just thought, thought of a different, like we were thinking about a more, much more wiser and better solution for the homeless in our community. Um, it's a, and it's such a rampant problem um, in Southern California and really in the nation, but mm -hmm. Um, and so my husband attended a conference, uh, and it was in Upland in a church a couple years back, but it was uh, a conference that was about house, that talked about housing first. So the, f I, the first solution for people who were homeless was to house them. Um, and uh, they tried this model in uh, different cities, and, um, and this model like stemmed from like Christian churches who like came together and tried to find solutions to this problem. And it started in Denver. Um, so in Denver, you know, um, the city asked the churches to just sponsor one homeless um, household per year um, just to house them. And so then they just realized that it saved the city a lot of money. Um, so there was one man, his name was Million Dollar Murray. And he, I think he was in Denver, but, um, they tracked him, um, and they realized that he's costing the city a million dollars for, I don't know, several years from being going in and out of prison um, or jail, and then um, using the city services, um, the cleanup, so many things that go in to um, managing the homeless population. So th what the cities do is they just manage it. Um, and we would see, you know, the police in Upland would just manage it. They'd kick them out <laughs> into Pomona. Mm -hmm. Pomona would kick them out. They'd just keep moving. Um, but nobody had a real solution. Um, but we realized that these other cities in the country have, have, had, have come to different solutions. And so they'd do a homeless count every year and they'd see the counts going down. So we decided we just like stopped cold turkey on the feedings and we were like, we're doing housing first model. <laughs> and so, um, this has been, I think, about two and a half years now, um, where like we would sponsor um, up to four households a month. So either we would, we'll, either we do um, like brand new housing from someone who's homeless or homeless prevention. Um, so 
so sometimes it's that um, someone who's on the street gets disability already from um, from the state, but they don't have enough money for like first and last rent, mm -hmm. or something prevents them from just like getting into their home. Um, so we've helped, yeah, I, don't, I think up to 60 like households in the past couple of years, but um, it's still in its infancy, you know. Um, yeah, it just I don't know. It's helped. It's helped me so much. Um, there's a group of churches that do um, what we call welcome homes um, in the area, and so what they do is um, like an agency has somebody that's ready to be housed, but they they just don't have. They have a checklist of items that they need. So whether it's a bed or a couch or a, uh, anything, an iron. Uh, um, so they have this list, and so they ask congregations to just get all the items. Um, to donate them and then to go to that um, that household and sort of welcome them into their new uh, apartment. Um, and so we were assigned a lot of those. Um, so we would do about once a month as well in addition. Um, and it's really um, very such a very simple thing just to show up, yes. um, just to bring a pillow or to bring something. Um, but it's very impactful for people. Um, I remember just going to one of them and um, we had like two vans full of stuff. You know, people had donated, and and I just to um, like go from the van to the apartment. I was just holding a pillow, you know, from all the stuff. I think I had like a child with me, and then I was just holding a pillow. But the man who was um, we were moving in, he saw that pillow, and he was so he started crying. He was so happy. He's like, I can't believe that you guys brought me a pillow, and he was so happy. And I was like stunned, you know, I, I couldn't stop thinking about this man because I was like, we don't have just a pillow, we have all the stuff that you need. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just like our congregation, but a lot of churches, um, like we just switch off months. Um, but it just, you know, got to thinking about the things we take for granted and how um, the type of life that um, we lead, like that, the life, the lives of excess that we lead. Um, and everybody's guilty of that, you know, and it's just it's just um, a journey, I think, for people and for me as well. It's just a, a journey um, to try to, um, you know, rid yourself of those attachments. Um, but, you know, I think it helps when you see other people who don't have what you have. And um, so it kind of helped me personally, and I kind of like to go, and it's also for personal reasons, you know, to kind of become a better person. and. Lately, I've been thinking about like um, this um, Betsy Davos. The, um, I don't know what her role is exactly, but the education head. And it's all a mess, don't <laughs> <Yeah>. bother. <laughs> so her, um, I've been thinking about like two examples. Her, um, and she's like a multi-billionaire, and she wants she wants to take away like um, free lunch for kids in schools. And and my husband was like, I can't believe like what kind of a wretched person who has billions of dollars would want, she could afford lunch for every child in America, mm -hmm. right? He's like, what kind of wretched person like, do you have to be? Um, and you feel some, like you feel sorrow for that kind of person who is like holding on to their wealth so much that they can't let it go, you know? Mm -hmm. Thinking about like, thinking they'll live forever or they want to save it for their, their own kids and but someone who could afford it, you know, and wants to take it away. And, thinking about her and she calls herself like a Christian, you know, and then um, there's like in Chicago Chance the Rapper who's donated a million dollars. And I was telling my husband, you know, he's so young, he's 23 years old. Mm -hmm. He could sit and say like, oh, you know what, I need to save, I need this money mm -hmm. until like, because I'm going to still live a long life, you know, mm -hmm. and I need to save my money and, I, and if I have kids, and, but he donated a million dollars and he calls himself a Christian. So. You know, there are people who are, you just can't, I, you can't put a label on it. It's just an attribute, it's a value. Yeah. And he's a, he's, a, he's a young man of faith, you know? And he could just go, you just know he's a man of faith. Even if he wasn't labeled as a Christian or anything, yeah. you could see the real people who are willing to give up from what they have on, to, put, to put it for other people. I want to ask you one question because I think these folks here would rather talk to you and <laughs> okay. maybe they have questions as well. Um, particularly around your work, I know that there's people in the room who do similar like work yeah. mm -hmm. and having those kind of meetings happen would be a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to take away from that, but just 
I just wanted that last question. I mean, what, what got you into interfaith chaplaincy? Well, um, you know, I was actually, I'm just so interested in the interfaith scene, and I've been, and I, I feel like from people of the same religion, you know, you meet with them, you learn from them, and you feel like, um, I sort of feel like I've learned so much from them that I felt like I need to quench my thirst, like, some, from other people. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, at some point you feel like, okay, I've, I, I've, like, met so many people, I know the way they think, but I want to know more. I want to know about, like, I personally feel like, okay, like, that God is, like, everywhere and everyone and everything, and, and how to see or know God from the perspective of other people um, who may have, like, a different lens, you know? Um, I think people of faith are always, you know, striving to do good, but it's, sometimes it's a different perspective or a different angle, and um, it's really helped me a lot, I think, to just try to understand who God is and why He, why we have all these different faiths and why. Um, so I was interested in the interface, like learning about um, people of different faiths. And, but I kind of was, um, I don't know, I feel like so interested in chaplaincy work um, and interfaith chaplaincy work as well, just because I felt like from my own faith perspective, there really aren't many people who are um, like open to serving all people. So there's sort of this insular, um, and it's it's getting better. And I think like specifically in the United States, it's getting better. People are kind of looking to serve like everybody. But sometimes you'll still see that person who you know will ask you, well, you know, are these sandwiches going to Muslims? You know, they'll still ask that. Um, and I think that's still like it's just a very primitive, undeveloped way of thinking. Um, and so I was kind of like, you know, I don't want to put boundaries on anybody or anything as as it pertains to ser serving people. Um, and then, you know, there are so many um, interfaith families. I mean, I think that's the new, the next sort of generation. We're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, it, it already exists, but I think um, it's just the natural course of things. So to try to navigate, um, navigate those boundaries, like between faith and very I don't know, it's very interesting to me. Um, and I'm, I feel like most interested in, you know, how do we um, how do we make accommodations for people of different faiths and then, but then still have them be true to their own faith. I think it's just one of those like, un yet to be like untapped, um, untapped fields so that I'm really kind of interested in that. And you for taking it. Chaplaincy for me has always been something I very, very much respect just because you're sort of in the thick of things. Mm -hmm. um, having to somehow be present in, in a time when we rather hide or go yeah. away. So really appreciate your work. Um, I want to kind of open it up to the room um, to see if there's people who have questions. And, um, yes. <clears throat> what do you two think about conversion? Can can uh, can attempting to convert a, a person from one faith to another ever be legitimate? Yeah, um, you know, I personally feel.